Welcome back, everybody. So now we have part two of the Michael Tellinger story. Today he's going to be sharing many of the, some of the, showing some of the artifacts he's actually found at some of these amazing sites around South Africa, and some more, more information about the energy and some of the kind of technological magic that these people who lived here thousands of years ago may have been working with. So it's going to be a revelatory talk, I think, this one. So please keep a beady eye on this one. It's going to be amazing. So please give a warm welcome to Michael Tellinger. Thanks, everybody. Welcome back. Right, I'm going to, I've got a lot of information. I'm going to do this really at a pace. Also, because I know that, the, you know, sitting and listening to this kind of stuff can get a little bit overwhelming. So I'm going to try and entertain you at the same time, to the best of my ability. Yes. We learned that uh, there are at least 10 million mysterious stone circular ruins in Southern Africa. I showed you the evidence of that. That forces us to rethink everything we know about our human history. The word mythology actually in its original form means sworn testimony of past events, not imaginary or made up stuff. And then just a list of other things that we learned. We know less about our human origins than is permissible by the laws of physics. I showed you that. Uh, 10 to the minus 34, Planck's constant. We know less than that. And uh, that is a very important thing for us to consider. These are not simple things for us to wrap our heads around and our minds around. Um, history of planet Earth is mysterious, far more mysterious than we could ever, ever possibly imagine. And you've seen a lot of information by the various speakers about that. Everything is connected. Sorry, frequency is the backdrop to the universe, and frequency seems to be this weird source of energy that drives everything so that we can actually me measure it and detect it in the electromagnetic universe, as we call it. Everything is connected through this invisible magical thing called consciousness. The evidence of antiquity is all around us. I think you've seen enough evidence of that from the various presenters and speakers here yesterday and in your lives before. Evidence of advanced ancient technology is all around us, and I'm going to share some of that with you today. Now, just to remind you that some of the ancient artifacts that we believe were energetic devices and energy generating devices is a very interesting photograph showing some interesting waves, magnetic waves coming out of the Great Pyramid. Now, there's technology, photographic technology, that you can do all these wonderful things with. We'll be doing much more of this at the ruins and at Adam's calendar in the weeks to come. Um, and then I'm going to drop a bombshell on you. How many geologists in the audience today? Show of hands. Okay. <laughs> I'll just have to, you'll just have to take my word for this. Stonehenge is a lot older than anyone's ever possibly imagined. Much, much older. And I dropped this on the, the people at Megalithomania last year just to show you some geological uh, evidence that I believe irrefutably shows that we're dealing something extremely old, not just a few thousand years old, but hundreds of thousands, if not millions of years old. Now, for this, you need to accept certain things, and that is we need to accept that that stone lying flat over there used to be the twin of this one here. Apparently, we get told that that's what it was, and they were joined by a lintel across the top. And then that one fell over and broke in three places. Well, when I walked in there, I was shocked to see this because I work with rocks every day of my life, and I know what a fresh break looks like. I know what a break looks like that's a few years old and a few hundred years old and so forth. When you look at the break in that stone there, this is sarsen stone, apparently extremely hard, the erosion on that break is not something that would have happened in a few hundred, even in a few thousand years. So from a geological perspective, the stones do not lie to us. And you can see that we're dealing with something that's taken an extremely long time to erode. So wrap your heads around that, and I would put that in a few hundred thousand years at least to get to that kind of level of erosion. The next very interesting um, phenomenon is this particular lintel. Now, no self-respecting builder uh, or architect will put a lintel up that's got a crack in it. They drag this from 300 miles away or whatever and put it up there. My guess is that that lintel was intact when it was put up there. Look at the erosion around that crack. That is spectacular. That's not something that erosion did not happen in a few thousand years. That's an extremely long period of exposure that that kind of erosion can happen. My take on Stonehenge, we're dealing with something that's 500,000 years old. 
Make, you know, do with that information what you want. Remember, yesterday I started off by saying, don't believe a word I say. Take the information and go and do your own research and uh, then, you know, reach your own conclusions. I'm just presenting you with some interesting facts and some theories and conclusions that I've reached by putting the pieces of the puzzle together. Sometimes I like to uh, tell people I, like, uh, I do what the guys in CSI do. I just follow the clues and follow the evidence, and then I reach my conclusions based on the clues and the evidence. And there is really no other way. And right now, what I'm sharing with you is some of my conclusions and, and the evidence that I'm finding. Right, the other important thing is that what we left off yesterday, what happened to all these millions of stone ruins that um, were scattered throughout Southern Africa? Well, remember yesterday you saw in compelling evidence from Graham and from um, Andrew about this event called the flood around you know, 11, 12,000 BC in that time period, more or less. It seems that all ancient civilizations have a flood in their culture. They all talk about a giant flood that destroyed not only their civilization, but probably the world. Well, I believe it was that same flood that around that same period came across Southern Africa and wiped out this advanced, technologically advanced gold mining civilization. And you can see it by the amounts of sediment on all the stone ruins that you see. We only see a fraction of the stone ruins, the circular stone ruins and the roads, the channels that connect them, the terraces. We only see a small fraction that have been exposed. The rest of it is still covered under the soil. And here are just some pieces of evidence that, that show you that. Here's another beautiful example of the sedimentation along the, the mountaintops and the sides of the mountain. Remember that some of the best um, preserved examples of these stone structures are on tops of the mountains. And uh, there have been, uh, there's been reports from um, people all over the place that they found seashells, sea sands being found in there, and fossilized fish in these stone circles. And that tells a story in itself. So <clears throat> all of this activity in Southern Africa is all about gold. And this is the one very important thing. Human history cannot be separated from our obsession with gold. In Genesis 2, when Adam was alone on earth, now you've got to think about this. There's no Eve. She has not yet been fashioned from his rib. Adam is alone. This dude walking around, don't know what he was doing. But God comes to him and says, hey, there's a place called Havilah. And uh, it's a really cool place. There's a lot of the, the, the land is good. There's a lot of water. And by the way, buddy, there's gold. Now, you've got to ask yourself, why would God want to tell Adam that there's gold in this place called Havilah? And I want you to go there because I want you to dig it for me, you bugger. Something like that. And uh, wherever there are gold mines, there are stone circles. And that seems to be the pattern wherever you go throughout all of southern Africa. And when you start re realizing how many of these gold mines we actually have, this whole thing becomes absolutely amazing. This is just an aerial shot of this, this, some of these gold mines I'm going to show you now. There are two different kinds of gold mines we're dealing with here. The adit mines that go into the side of the mountains, high up, uh, normally no, uh, near the crest of the mountain, in the rocky areas. And then obviously the normal gold mines that go down into the ground, which we probably won't see because of the flood and the sedimentation. So let's first see if we can recognize some. These are some of the examples of the added gold mines that have been recently opened, and I believe that wherever they're gold mines, they, you know, as you can see, oh, let me just show you this slide again. You can see stone circles, terraces, stone circles, all connected together via, uh, via terraces, and all along that ridge there, that's where you get all these gold mines. <clears throat> this is what they look like. Some of them, or many of them, have been reopened in the 1800s with the gold rush we had in South Africa. Um, just some examples. The day that I went up there, I walked through at least 30 of these. And then, for those of you who like orbs, there's a little treat. Inquisitive fellas. Um, in 2005, a geological company in Pumalanga, South Africa, did a, started a survey on behalf of, uh, of I believe it's Anglo-American, um, or one of the big mining companies because they felt they wanted to close up these gold mines, these adit mines, to prevent illegal gold mining. Well, they counted um, for five years, and in the mid-2010, they stopped counting when they realized it was going to be financially unrealistic and unfeasible to close these gold mines. And uh, the number of gold mines they counted at that point was 75,000. 
So this is just in the Barberton, Leidenberg area. 75,000 added gold mines. So I want you to expand on that exponentially and imagine the whole of Southern Africa. Zimbabwe, Botswana, Mozambique. How many millions of these gold mines there must have been? And that doesn't mean gold mines. These are just added gold mines. What about the ones into the ground? That gets even more interesting and mysterious. So let's go over there. Um, at least you see where we're going with this. <clears throat> When I was up in uh, Limpopo, two completely independent guys came up to me and said, when their grandfathers were mining gold in Limpopo province in the 30s, they came upon these, about 100 feet down, they came upon these passages that started going into all directions, filled with these mysterious artifacts and tools, and they didn't know what they were. They were really mesmerized. So they called in the experts. Who are the experts in South African gold mining origin? The Marensky Reef people, right? Um, that control the gold mining industry. So they came there and the answer to them was, thank you for calling us, thanks for showing us the artifacts, we'll take them with us. Uh, and the answer was, we are aware of this. So clearly, there are ancient gold mines deep under the ground, all over Southern Africa, that the, that the modern uh, mining companies are aware of. And that's an interesting thing to discover. So, now we know we got millions of gold mines scattered through southern Africa. There can be no doubt where King Solomon's mines were. And remember, King Solomon is known as Shalumi, the ancient African king who owned all the gold mines. So let's reevaluate who Solomon was and who he may have been, because remember, we know less than is, than is permissible by the laws of physics about our human history. And uh, maybe there's another twist in the tale here. Uh, the wonderful Anne Kritzinger at Zimbabwe University is a, a geologist there, and she's written several papers now where she shows conclusive evidence in her geological papers that the so-called slave pits or animal pits or grain pits in some of the ruins of Zimbabwe have nothing to do with slaves, grain, or animals, but they were actually extraction tanks for the processing of gold. And I suggest you find her papers online. They are available. They are a fascinating read. Completely independently of what I'm doing, she has presented the same kind of evidence. And then obviously, you, you, we find out that Great Zimbabwe is the grandest of them all. And when you look at it from the aerial shots, you realize it's exactly the same civilization, the same structure, the same connections with channels and terraces around it. And we start realizing that we're dealing with this large population of people that covered most of Southern Africa mining gold. And when you start reading some of the interesting, provocative tra Sumerian translations, and I know that Zechariah Sitchin has undergone a huge amount of flack from everywhere, quite frankly, personally, I place my trust in a guy that has devoted his entire life to one specific study, then somebody who's devoted a year or two or even a decade. So the more you read Sitchin's translations, the more we find these discoveries here, the more we start supporting many of his theories. I'm not saying he was, he was right on everything, but certainly some of these things, like for example, that the Abzu was in Southern Africa. This was the Abzu, the gold mining place where the gold came from. Remember Abantu people? Abantu, the children of Antu, who is Antu, the wife of Anu, a Sumerian goddess who loved the Abzu, where the gold came from, and you start putting this all together. Um, great rivers there rapidly flowed, and abode by the flowing waters Enki for himself established. He established a fortress for his house and other places where the workers would live and where the bowels of the earth to enter, places of deepness he determined for those heroes into the earth's bowels to descend, obviously to extract the gold. And then we realize that we're dealing with the serpent worship and Enki's presence in the south. Yesterday I mentioned Paul Grevenstein to you, the man that cures all disease here in South Africa, the new royal Raymond Reif. What a phenomenal man. Just to be in his presence is absolutely something very, very special. Now, when Paul Grevenstein phoned me out of the blue, he knows nothing about anything. He phoned me out of the blue, and, and since he met me and he saw some of my books, he phoned me and he said, I just looked at the, you know, I looked at Adam's calendar and I looked at... Um, Great Zimbabwe, and they connected, they both connected with the energy of Enki. And I, and I said to him, thank you, Paul, because this is exactly what my conclusion is. And uh, remember that he can look at things and he actually sees the energy fields and he analyzes them with, not only with his eyes and his, his, and his uh, 
ability to detect it, but also through a specific computerized model that he's built that seems to work very well for him in the agricultural industry as well. And we start seeing this ancient serpent worship thing that, that seems to permeate pretty much all of, all of the ancient cultures. And until recently, we thought that the serpent worship was really not what, you know, Southern Africa was excluded from that, but how wrong could we be? After all, if this is the cradle of humankind, which has just even last week been shown by the latest scientific genetic studies that they now tell us that this is the cradle of humankind from a genetic perspective, there must be serpent worship in Southern Africa. And here you have it, the serpent worship site at Sodilo Hills, northern Botswana. This is known by Credo Mutwa, calls it the creation cave of the human race. He visited these caves um, with the Khoi Khoi, Khoi San people uh, after the war, and apparently they offered um, carved heads made out of jasper to the serpent as part of a shamanic ritual. And um, he tells me that Sodilo Caves, as a serpent worship site, is one of the two most sacred sites on earth, both linked to the creation of the human race. Well, guess where the other one is? We can get it to a little bit later. Adam's calendar. Of course it has to be. And suddenly the serpent worship brings us to understanding the links from the southern vanished civilization in southern Africa to all the great civilizations of the north, the Romans, Phoenicians, Egyptians, all of them. And it's always about gold. This Phoenician fract uh, fraction of a Phoenician bowl was found near Great Zimbabwe in 1891 by Theodore Bent in his brilliant book. For those of you who don't know, go find Theodore Bent's work a phenomenal archaeologist that did, probably did more for research and archaeology in South Africa, Southern Africa, than anyone else. Also, this Roman coin from 138 AD of Emperor Antoninus Pius was found 25 meters deep in a gold mine. So the Romans were here mining gold already at that stage. This Sumerian Babylonian coin from 300 BC was found in the foundations of Marion Hill Monastery when they were digging that up in KZN. KwaZulu Natal, for those of you that don't know what KZN means. And then these Hindus, the Dravidian Hindus, this influence can be dated back based on some information that are being given by archaeologists who do not want to be named. Remember that some of the academics that I do work with at universities actually are friends of mine, so I'm not really that slanderous about all the academics. There are some really wonderful people among them. I'm just going to backtrack a bit here. <laughs> but um, some of them showed me evidence that can... That can uh, show the, you know, the presence of the Dravidian Hindus here about 2000 BC already. And these dolmen that are directly linked to these Hindus, this was exposed by the brilliant Cyril Hromnik in 1891 in his book Indo-Africa. And I suggest you try and get it. It's out of print. It's a phenomenal book filled with incredible information and the immense effect that the Dravidian Hindus had on the culture and the development in Southern Africa over the last at least 2,000 years. And then, then we go a little bit further, and we see that these Dravidian Hindus left behind even their symbols of fertility, like this one here, in some of the stone circles. So we can start seeing how civilizations move and live on top of each other. This is ultimately the rule number one in archaeology. Civilizations build on top of each other. And proof of habitation does not constitute proof of construction. And this, I believe, is they get, this is what causes them to get it wrong time and time again. When they find some pottery shards or bone fragments, the Stonehenge or wherever, and in the stone circles in Southern Africa, and they get all excited. Oh, you see, this is the Sudutswana culture or the Bakoni culture. The people must have built it. It's like saying that if you find a Barbie doll in, in Grand Central Station claiming that this must have been the factory that manufactured Barbie dolls, something similar to that. And um, I don't quite buy that. And then you see some really interesting connections. On the left, you've got a headrest from Egypt. On the right, you got a headrest from Southern Africa, from South Africa, actually. It's in the same museum that the Sumerian Babylonian coin comes from. And what you start seeing is the pillars of Egypt and the concentric stone circles of Southern Africa. And you start seeing that they actually built the, the architectural structures into these interesting you know, headrests. And then you realize that the, what, what we often refer to as the Sumerian circles or the cross, the cross in a circle, which then becomes the the original Sumerian winged disc actually originally seems to come from Southern Africa because these carvings, there are thousands of them at Drikops Eiland and all over many other places as well, 
uh, these crosses in circles on very, very hard stone. This is andesite, which is the same as diorite. It's extremely hard. Some of the statues of the pharaohs in Egypt are carved out of this diorite rock, this black rock, which is extremely hard. Now, if you compare the weathering and the erosion of those 4,000 old statues from Egypt, you'll see there's very, very little erosion that's actually occurred on those statues. They look quite fresh. And when you start looking at the erosion on some of these, you realize that we're dealing with something extremely old here. And this is not new in African culture. Greater Muto once again points out that this cross in a circle is referred to as Mabona, Lord of Light, in, in African culture, Southern African culture. And there you have it. There you can see the original Sumerian winged disc, the cross in a circle with these lines coming out of it. Well, I found this cross in a circle with these lines sticking out of it. It's badly eroded, but you can see they were certainly coming out of it there. And I suggest that we're dealing once again with a link to Southern Africa long before it became known up in Sumeria. Uh, and what does this mean? Great is the all-seeing Lord of the sky, Mabona. That's what that symbol means in African culture. And then we start meeting and seeing interesting um, evidence of a sun-worshipping culture. Remember, when the Portuguese arrived, you know, those earliest references of the stone circles in Southern Africa from 1510, from Antonio Fernandes, when he started talking about the Karanga or the Makaranga or Makalanga people, the children of the sun, right? Uh, and here we have evidence of a sun-worshipping culture in Southern Africa that shouldn't really be here. What I think Robert Temple will find quite interesting, all these radiating things coming out of, you know, radiating uh, circular structures. This here is eerily close to uh, for the four seeds of, of, uh, of uh, life or creation of the Dogon people of Mali. Uh, this incomplete circle with these very specific lines coming out of it. Once again, note the erosion on the cracks that go through these, um, these carvings. I believe that no self-respecting artist will carve anything on a crack or a torn canvas. So I suggest that the cracks occurred after the carvings were made. So by looking at the carvings, we can start seeing that we're dealing with something extremely old. And there are thousands of these examples. I'm just showing you a handful here. <clears throat> and then we get to the Egyptian Ankh. We think we call it the Egyptian Ankh. Well, do we have possible evidence of its origins here in Southern Africa? Just very quickly, I believe now absolutely that the, the, the Ankh was actually a frequency device. It's a very specialized tuning fork. And for those of you that, that uh, know the, about the story about John Keeley in 1888 when he created his levitation device and his crushing device using sound, um, he used what's described as you know, a circle of sound devices that he used, and it was tuned, the, the way he was able to levitate the stuff and do whatever he was doing, it was tuned to his own body's energy fields. If somebody else came in there, he had to first tune that device to that person's energy field, and only then could they do lift, you know, use that sound frequencies to lift the stones or whatever they were doing. And that's why you see... These guys in Egypt all had their own little ankh that they carried. I believe that those were special ankh that were tuned to their own body's frequencies, and that's why they could perform certain things. That, and they didn't just sort of haphazardly, you know, let me borrow your ankh, I don't want to levitate that oak over there, you know. Uh, so they, they all had that, and clearly it was used for healing. This guy, this, this chick is healing this oak here, and this oak's waiting for him to keel over or survive, right? And they draw these pictures for us, and... There it is. And do, where does the unk come from? Oh, you see, lo and behold, here we have a beautiful unk in a radiating circle. This picture paints a thousand words. I just love this stuff when you come across it. Can you see the unk there inside the radiating circle? I thought this would be tricky. Okay, and now we get to some of the really interesting crossovers. Remember I mentioned the brilliant Theodore Bent in 1891, um, he came to the conclusion that the bird on a pedestal is actually the symbol that was used for the protection of the gold miners. He found this, this carving of this image carved at the entrance to many gold mines that he explored in the Near East, including Egypt. And it was always this bird on a pedestal that was the symbol used by the gold miners for protection, looking up at the gods for protection. Well, is there another evidence in Southern Africa of, of birds on pedestals? Oh boy, of course there is. The most famous birds on pedestals, the Zimbabwean birds. And where were the first gold mines in the world? Right here in Southern Africa. Where were the first gold mining protectors, birds on pedestals? Right here in Southern Africa. And suddenly the mysterious 
Um, symbolism of the birds on pedestals in southern Africa comes out of hiding, out of the shadows. And we realize we're dealing with the first mascots and the protectors of these early, early gold miners. But some of these birds on pedestals weren't beautifully carved stones. Some of them are exquisitely carved. Some were very basic. Basically, what you're dealing with was just a piece of stone, normally an elongated piece of stone. And they just carve a little wing on it, put a little dot there for the head, and it becomes a stone, the, 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 you know, the bird looking up at the sky for protection from the gods. And uh, so if you take the eye away and you take this away, you're just looking at an elongated stone with a, a broad base, and it narrows down to the top with this little very interesting angle over there. That's what I found interesting. And I have found dozens and dozens of these kind of stones with the broad base and the little slanted top. This is probably one of the best examples. But there are hundreds, actually, of these beautiful examples that I found. Um, this one here is an example. And I'm just going to step out here and hold it up for you so you can see it in real life. It's one of the most beautiful artifacts I've found. Most of these artifacts I find driving around the forestry areas. You know, when they, when they build the forestry roads, they do an archaeological dig for us. Hallelujah. Thank you very much. So you just need to know what you're looking for, and you find these amazing ar uh, artifacts everywhere. So let me show you. This is also clearly a carving, I believe, of a bird. And here it is. I believe, I believe that was planted in the ground. You can see it was carved up to about 20 centimeters from the bottom. And that's why the, the bottom is not really shaped, only the top. And there you have a beautifully carved bird looking at the sky for protection from the gods while they go down on the ground. And uh, I'll talk more about the patina that covers this piece of stone. Uh, here's an interesting phenomenon that I have to bring into this because on my tour of America, this Coral Castle thing became a huge phenomenon. Now, this is the chap that built single-handedly this amazing place in Orlando, Florida called Coral Castle. And it's, it's just amazing because it consists of a huge number of very, very large stones, coral, uh, big slabs of coral, some of them weighing up to 10 and more tons and he single-handedly constructed this huge place that's known as Coral Castle. And uh, beautiful doors that pivot on a small little axis. And just nobody understands how he did this. There are various theories. This is, this is one of the devices that he made, or this is the device that he made to do all this stuff with. Now, when I see this device, I start seeing you know, standing stones just in a very small kind of structured way. Remember, we're dealing with energy devices and suddenly you see standing stones, Stonehenge or something like that, with internal structures. And I'll show you more about the internal structures a little bit later. And this is where we come upon the ice cream cone phenomenon, something that I've just started calling you know, the other day. I'm going to quickly tell you. One of the stories that I've been told, the truck drivers apparently used to deliver the, the, the coral to him. He used to make them get out, stand around the corner while he single-handedly offloaded these huge slabs of stone, 10 tons and so forth. And then a few minutes later, he'd come around and say, okay, you can take the truck and go. Nobody knows how he did it, but there are reports of eerie sounds and the high frequency pitch noises and so forth. Um, but there were, I heard the story about two school kids that reported seeing him from the bushes nearby. Uh, he obviously didn't know they were looking at him. And when they came home, they told their parents that we saw him offload this, these big blocks with, he had two ice cream cones in his hand and they were making strange noises. And obviously, you can imagine what their parents said to him. Yeah, go away, naughty kids. All you want is ice cream, right? Yeah. But that is not the case. That magical word, the ice cream cones, was probably the sweetest two words that I heard in a long, long time. And I'm going to bring back the ice cream cone phenomenon a little bit later. Remember, we're dealing with sound and the focusing of sound frequencies. These stone circles in Southern Africa are not just any kind of stone. They're very special kind of stones, and they all ring like bells. I've just recently, in the last two weeks, made some new discoveries that I'm not going to really talk about now, but I'll be, I'll be writing in my next book about it. Uh, and it deals with the kind of stone that is used in the walls and the, it, the mystery and the, the amazing ability of these people to use the laws of nature to generate energy is just getting more and more amazing. Um, we're dealing with metamorphosized quartzite. Okay, this is the very hard black stone. Uh, it looks something like this. 
This is a fragment of one of the stones. It's known as hornfowls in Southern Africa. It's a specific special kind of stone here. It rings like a bell. I'm going to show you now. And on the inside, you can see it's very, very black. And then it's covered by this patina. That patina grows very, very slowly. We don't really have an exact dating on how quickly or slowly it grows. But we know that it takes thousands of years per microscopic layer. So when you have patina growing on something that's a centimeter or five millimeters thick, you know that whatever that artifact is and whenever it was done was not done in recent times. And we're dealing with extremely long periods of time. So we got stones that ring like bells, specifically metamorphosized quartzite. You're pretty much looking at a very specialized quartz crystal here. It's extremely hard. You can't break the stone. I tried to break one on top of the mountain to send to the lab for patina growth studies. I couldn't break it. I had to send the whole stone into the lab and tell them to cut it in half. Um, and then you start seeing these interesting tools, these phenomenal tools, these pointed, conical-shaped tools all over the place. And you start seeing what I start referring to as the ice cream cone phenomenon. This is a very special one. And there are hundreds of these that I've been collecting. These are not for hitting, smashing, or stabbing. That is our primitive brains that are telling, it that, that are telling us that. It's for something completely different. Remember, we're dealing with sound and the generation of sound energy. And then, and then we see some interesting other interesting artifacts that I've been collecting, like phalluses, these amazing phalluses. I have probably five of these different shapes and sizes. This is another one. This, this one I found in the graveyard in Waterfallburfen. When they go and dig graves, they're actually doing an archaeological dig for you. I'm not allowed to do that, but I can snoop around graveyards. That's great. Um, here's another beautiful one. I'll show you this one. This is not a small phallus. And once again, it's completely covered by patina. There is not a sign. There's few chips and scrapes on it, so you can see how deep and how thick the patina is. So once again, we're dealing with something that is extremely old. Here are just some of the others that I showed you. Um, this is just a beautiful example of another ice cream cone phenomenon. Flat here and pointed over there, so it seems like it was inserted into something and pointed at something. Here's what I call the oldest statue on earth. Just love this. I showed this to a few arts majors. I said, what do you make of this? Is this a statue or a natural thing? And they all went, no, no, that's a carved statue. So I'll go with the arts majors. Again. And then, just, you know, the... The ice cream cone phenomenon, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these ice cream cone conical shaped stones, all pointed very specifically, all made of the same stone, the hornfels, the metamorphosized quartzite. And we start seeing that we've got an interesting story developing here. And this is what we're going to get to a little bit later, the sacred stone, right? Just to quickly show you why I say these stones ring like bells, I'll just go here. There's a, another example of a, a big, either a bird or a phallus. There's some more examples on the mountain of a, another broad base, narrow at the top. See that little angle at the top that was looking up at the sky for protection from the gods? And then these artifacts here that I'm going to show you now, the stones that ring like bells. And it was... It was when, uh, when we were clearing some of the sites for, um, you know, so we can take people there that I heard the sound by accident and I went, hold on, we're dealing with sound here. This is sound frequency. This has got nothing to do with cattle crawl and, you know, dwellings. Remember, they got no entrances. Most of these circles have no entrances. The ones that are covered by soil have no entrances. The reconstructed, the most recently used ones, have newly inserted entrances. But... This is a beautiful example of a, of a Stone Age club. Once again, somebody carved this and shaped it, and it's covered in patina, some of the cracks. This was lying in the middle of the forestry road. My friend Bill and I drove over this several times. Eventually, I said, Bill, stop. I've got to pick that thing up. You know, so it's full of you know, you know, damage from forestry trucks. But this is 
what I mean by stones ring like bells. And here's a Stone Age guitar. If you think this is an accidental shape, once again, you know, oh, it's just natural erosion. Rubbish. This was specifically carved for this particular shape because it's like a strange kind of tuning fork. Once again, I think, you know, when Indiana Jones gets into the middle of the temple and there's like this thing that he's got to put a crystal in and that activates all the stuff that starts to happen around him. Well, it's all sound, isn't it? All light. So I think we're dealing with the same kind of thing here, that these things are like the activating devices that were, had these weird shapes. I mean, listen to this. This is just. And when you hold it, you feel the frequencies, the vibration through your body. It's beautiful. So. I'm really just showing you a fraction of these stones that ring like bells. And then we get to these sacred stones. Beautiful. There are hundreds of thousands of these stones with beautifully carved holes in them. Now, the Archaeological Society of South Africa claims that these were weights for digging sticks. That although they come from a stone age, where there was no metal tools to make these holes through these very hard stones, very hard rock. I mean, this is hard. They come in all shapes and sizes, from little ones like this to large ones like this. But the hole in the middle always remains a specific size, and that's crucial. That specific size here ranges between about one centimeter and maybe two to about six or seven centimeters, and that's it. It doesn't get bigger. Now, there's a very specific reason to that, and it all comes down to frequency and sound, and I'll explain to you why I say that. Now, among all these beautiful stone ruins and artifacts, 10 million stone ruins and more, where's the flagship? Among the somewhere there needs to be something that sticks out like a sore thumb. Absolutely. Adam's calendar. And thank God for Johann Heine not listening to the academics and uh, believing that it was something special and unique and insisting on going back and measuring it and discovering that it was indeed highly significant. So significant so that when I met with Greater Mutwa, he actually asked, to come, asked me to come and see him through my friend Amanda. And uh, when I got there and I showed him our first publication of Adam's Calendar, he started to cry. He literally burst into tears. And uh, he told me he was initiated at Adam's Calendar in 1937. It is one of the two most sacred sites on earth. He says, it is where heaven mated with Mother Earth, one of the two creation sites of the human race. And it gets more freaky from there, so hold on to your seats. <laughs> this is just another view of Adam's calendar, the two central calendar stones. I'll take you through this quickly. This is a view. In fact, I now believe that those two central stones have got nothing to do with the calendar. It's just a very nice to have built in you know, feature, just like Stonehenge, it's very nice to know that the sun comes up there, but the actual structure itself is for something completely different. You know, I can put a few sticks in the ground to tell me where the sun comes up. I don't need to go to all this trouble. This is looking from the helicopter. That is north. That tree is next to a, the, the northern monolith. That is south. The two central stones in the middle. North-south dissects them exactly between the two calendar stones. Over there is where the stone man used to stay, what Credo, uh, stand, what Credo calls the clitoris of Mother Earth. And, um, and then you've got a perfect alignment from there over the stones and over what we discovered to be one of our finest findings lying right there on its side, linking us to Egypt. Um, and there's a cliff. Every one of these stones of the calendar is dolerite, extremely hard, and dolerite incidentally also rings like a bell. Some of the stone ruins are also made out of dolerite. All these stones have fallen over. You can see they used to be part of the original circles. Look at that beautiful pointed stone over there. That actually gave it away. This here is Black Reef Quartzite. That's the edge of the cliff. 
that drops down about a kilometer eventually into the, the Barberton Valley. It's known as the Transvaal Escarpment. And it is rich in gold. Remember, the Barberton Valley has the richest gold mine in the world. And guess what that mine is called? Sheba Gold Mine. I wonder if they knew something we don't. <laughs> this is just a view north between the two calendar stones. So you can see you're looking exactly north and very important to look at that that ominous little tree right on the horizon, that is not accidental. Something very special takes place there. And the stone man, which I now call the oldest sculpture on earth. And I know that uh, when Andrew was with us at the ruin, he was really impressed with this particular, um, with this particular stone. And this was taken out from Adam's calendar uh, in 2000 and, sorry, in 1992. And two years later, it was re returned so that they could put a plaque on it to commemorate the opening of the Blue Swallow Nature Reserve. So by miracle, it survived uh, having a post box planted on top of it in somebody's front garden, I guess. <clears throat> this is the alignment that you get on the spring equinox in the Southern Hemisphere. Sun comes right up above that. It's a few degrees out, but I'll point that out to you. There's a very specific reason for that. Why is it a calendar? Because... The setting sun, there's Johan Heiner, and the, I think this is the first trip that he ever took me out there, showing me why this is a calendar. As the sun sets, the shadow cast by this stone here, casts a shadow on that calendar stone there, and it starts here on the summer solstice and moves across every day of the year. You can mark where the sun sets, and on the winter solstice, it ends over there and starts to move back. And that is why it is a calendar. This is a 3D reconstruction of it, <clears throat> north, south, stone man back in situ, looking out over the two central calendar stones, and then those four stones over there that are just absolutely spectacular. <clears throat> and then this um, tree on the, on the horizon. So we went to investigate the one day, and guess what we found? This beautiful stone altar built that this tree is growing out of, and uh, when we when we had it analyzed with um, infrared photography, it suggests, the guy that did this analysis for me, he suggests that there was something, there's a cavity about three meters deep and three meters long that's, uh, that's underneath a stone. And that was the analysis of the, the infrared expert that came and did this for me, not my take on it. But I was obviously very happy to hear this because Credo told me, and several psychics told me, and I told you yesterday once again, I like to work with paranormal stuff. I'm not scared of it. There's been many, many scientific experiments done to show how important paranormal and metaphysical understanding is and how it's being used in military situations and so forth. If you still have a problem with that bit of scientific information, I suggest you go away and do some research. We need to embrace that as, as part of our study and not shy away from it and not be scared to bring it up. Just get, the, get your backing uh, information for that and you can use it. That's what I do. And I believe that uh, we're all entitled to do these kind of things. So... What is this little tree about? The story goes back to Sumeria, Inanna and Dumuzi. Inanna and Dumuzi were like the Romeo and Juliet of the Sumerian tablets. And when Dumuzi died sometime after the flood, according to the translations of Sitchin, which is interesting, it says that Inanna, so we're talking about less than 12,000 years ago, right? So it's not that far back compared to some of these other structures. Uh, it says in one of the translations that Inanna took his body to the deep Abzu where she buried him on the edge of a cliff near her father's, near his father's special place. Well, we, are beginning, we believe now that Adam's calendar is actually a construct made by Enki, uh, also linked to Osiris, and uh, therefore Inanna burying Dumuzi near his father's special place in the deep Abzu, the deep Abzu is the place where the gold came from, we start to get an interesting picture building up here. And there he is, Dumuzi, what I believe that this grave is possibly the grave of Dumuzi. And on the left, you have one of the images of Inanna standing on some gazelle, and uh, African gazelle possibly indicating the, the dominion over, of the African continent. And on the right here is what to me looks like a very interesting possible bust of a human body without its head. What I find interesting is that Inanna is always pictured with these perky boobs. Well, this, this uh, bust here with the feet down here, there's the legs going up, there the perky boobs and the head's missing. Uh, you know, do with that what you want. 
And uh, the other thing that we found there is an interesting carving of what I believe to be a, a sphinx, possibly one of the earliest sphinx ever carved, sphinxes ever carved. Also, out of very, very hard dolerite. The problem with these is that I think they may have had facial features at some stage, but this dolerite peels, and it peels in this very thin onion peel kind of things, and it, you know, whatever features it may have had are now gone. And uh, so let's get back to the dating. How do we date these stones? Um, all those things are taken into consideration. And like I said, I just examine the, fo the clues. I follow the clues and the evidence. And then I put together my, my assessment and my, hopefully my half scientific brain that still works. <clears throat> I like the last one, psychic revelations. Because it's okay if you have one psychic telling you one thing, but if, you have, if you've had more than 200 psychics tell you things completely independently, and the list keeps growing about what they concur on and what they tell you that it's all the same, and you've got to start telling yourself, okay, well, let's look at this, turn this into a scientific argument. What is the statistical probability that 200 psychics can tell me all these 20 or 30 or 40 things that are all the same about Adam's calendar and what was going on there? And if you ask a statistician, they'll tell you several million, if not several billion to one. So what I'm telling you here is the truth. <laughs> you didn't see the humor in that. Come on. <laughs> Statistically speaking, of course. Um, Geology tells us that these are not part of the bedrock. We have this from several geologists. We're dealing with stones that were brought from somewhere else. Giant, five-ton, ten-ton boulders and stones and monoliths brought from somewhere else to build this calendar site, not part of the bedrock. There's the bedrock, the Black Reef quartzite, rich in gold. And there's all the rock that was brought in, all the dolerite, to build Adam's calendar, or as we now call it, Enki's calendar. The lichen, lichen growth, these stones are covered. I mean, the lichen is so thick on some of them that it actually boggles the mind. And I believe it has something to do with the energy inside there, which I'll tell you right at the end. Um, you can do study on lichen growth. I believe, uh, I was told recently, that there are some tests that you can do to give you an indication how much lichen there is and how long you could possibly, but there's layer and layer upon lichen, and this particular lichen grows about one millimeter per annum. So to cover this stone alone from side to side will take about 2,000 years if the conditions are right. And if you add layer upon layer and upon layer of lichen, you get a multiplication uh, process that happens there, you know, thousands of years. The erosion is something spectacular. This rock here, that piece broke off there and fell down. There it is. It fits up there. Now, I've asked several geologists, say, give me an idea, how old is this, you know, how old is that break? You know, just your, your gut feel thought, I won't hold you to task on that. Or, and the average response was, I don't know, pick a number above 50,000 years or so. And so, you know, just geologically speaking, erosion-wise, it's very important. There are other erosion things that, that, that we look at, quite a few, but uh, I'd rather move on just to get to this. This is very interesting, and I know that Graham's going to find this fascinating, because the archaeoastronomy is phenomenal here. Because when you look at Adam's calendar, now these ancient civilizations did not make mistakes. If they did something, they did it consciously. I believe that the original alignment, there you can see Adam's calendar, it was originally a circular structure. There's north, there's south. The first thing that strikes you is that north-south does not align at 12 o'clock. It is out by three degrees, 17 minutes, and 42 seconds anti-clockwise. And for, you know, that was just the immediate thing that struck me. And I thought, okay, we're dealing with some strange phenomenon here. This doesn't make much sense. What's going on? And I believe the, these guys, especially if it was Enki that built it, they wouldn't make mistakes. At first, we got caught up in the whole processional thing and trying to figure out what, you know, how does this fit into the procession thing. And then I realized, hold on, but when you stand on planet Earth, true north and true south doesn't move. We are always, that's north. And we're not talking about magnetic north. We're talking about true north, the cardinal points of planet Earth. And then I realized we're probably dealing with the best evidence that Charles Habgood would have been extremely excited about that shows us that there has been an, uh, a crustal shift or a crust crustal displacement that has caused that three and a quarter degree drift or deviation from true north today. There's still a lot of um, research to be done here, but we clearly have physical evidence 
left behind in stone and the stones do not lie that we need to go investigate. And I believe if this is in fact what I think it is, we got physical evidence of very, very ancient structures that were built in times that we don't quite yet understand. Now, sterile alignment, all ancient cultures seem to be associated and, and, uh, and obsessed with Orion, right? Uh, these lovely pyramids here and uh, these pyramids here and, and, uh, and the Chinese pyramids. Uh, and then this is the Chinese pyramids, just some of the many, many pyramids in China, hundreds of them, um, also seem to be linked to Orion, according to the work of Nassim Haramein as well. And then Great Zimbabwe is also aligned to the rise of Orion. Well, could, if our Adam's calendar is so impressive and so important, could that also be linked to the rise of Orion? So we went and we looked at those stones lying there, which obviously scream to be investigated. When you lift them up, and you lift up this one especially, when you lift those up, you get a very, very clear alignment with the rise of Orion's belt. Now I remember, for some of you may know, that Osiris and Enki are are, are the same individual. This is what I you know, discovered actually relatively recently for some strange reason. So suddenly it starts to make sense. So we've got Enki's calendar, the calendar of Osiris. His son was Horus, and he was looking at the Orion. Osiris is, is associated with Orion, and, uh, and Horus is the son which is associated with Osiris. So now you've got an interesting link here. I've had two astro astronomers look at this. They gave me these two dates for it. I'm not 100% sure how they got to them, but they got to them through the alignment that it has to be perfectly exact for this. I know there's a lot of controversy about this, so take this, take this with a pinch of salt, but do with it what you want. I believe it's very important. The first, uh, first um, date we were given was 75,000 years, and then the second one was 160,000 years. Uh, we need to go back and evaluate that more. But could there be a guardian bird? Remember this bird fascination and the protector birds? Well... Protector birds come in more than one shape, not just the Zimbabwe birds and the birds on pedestals, but also in the shape of Horus. So could there be a protector bird at Adam's calendar? And there you have probably the oldest carving of what I believe is to be the earliest sculpture of Horus. Beautiful fat belly there. You don't really see it from this perspective, his neck. The nose is broken off. If you extend that by another foot, it would have come up to about there, and the back of the head is beautifully carved out. It's about four meters tall, this... this um, this monolith, it's spectacular. And if you lift it up, there you have it. Horus stone lining up with the rise of the sun, just like in Egypt, rising of the sun. The sun could be S-U-N or S-O-N. It's important to consider both those. And Horus looking at the rise of Orion, actually even lying still today, lying in the direction that he was facing. And that's quite interesting and quite important in this uh, discussion. And then, this is one of the earliest pictures taken of Johann in 2005 when he first discovered Adam's calendar. And we ignore this completely. Look behind him, over there in the valley. And this is the Barberton Impact Crater. It's uh, about 3.2 billion years old, showing the oldest rock formations in the world. And these don't belong there. They really are not part of the geological formation. I've checked this out geologically, and I've checked this out on, on the Google Maps. They completely separate, although they look like very distinct pyramids sticking out there. They're covered in soil. It looks like they got bedrock sticking out the top. But you know what? There's so much time has gone by, gone by and so much has happened that there could be some interesting things. And there's a third small pyramid right there between the two. It's completely covered by soil. You can hardly see it. I believe that there's at least 30 or 40 meters of sediment. If this was, in fact, the flood that covered all this, there would have been an extra kilometer of water down in the valley depositing huge amount of sediment on those pyramids down there. Therefore, the third one is not even hardly visible. But those two we're probably only seeing half of. And, you know, are they just stone mounds? Are they original? Are they natural bedrock? Are they just, you know, were they man-used or man-made? I don't know yet, but we know that they have very unique and unusual things that they do when you go there with a GPS. You lose your GPS position completely between the pyramids. And then I thought, well, these guys were really onto it with golden mean spirals and golden mean ratios. If they built something, everything was connected. So let me try this. And I connected Adam's calendar with, the great, with those pyramids, and guess what happens? Uh, well, I just inserted a golden mean spiral over it, 
And incidentally, you know that gold mean spirals run the opposite direction of the southern hemisphere to the northern hemisphere. They follow the Coriolis um, effect or the Coriolis fields. They, they run clockwise in the southern hemisphere and anticlockwise in the northern hemisphere. So that's one way of checking whether somebody is messing with you or not. So you can always check yourself. If you're in the north, recently in Dallas, there was a huge uh, spiral in the middle in the park in Dallas, and we were taken to it, and I thought, okay, well, let's check these guys if they, if they got their act together. And lo and behold, it runs anticlockwise. I was very impressed with that. But fortunately for us, this gold mean spiral runs clockwise in the southern hemisphere, from Adam's calendar over there, and ends up right between the pyramids. So you, once again, ask yourself, what is the statistical probability that Adam's calendar, or this could be linked. And the answer to that is that every pixel on this image is one statistical probability. Every point where that ends is a statistical probability. So, once again, think about it, make of that what you want. And then, the other interesting thing, Graham pointed out yesterday, the, the uh, Greenwich Mean Line was not always where it is today. It used to run through the Great Pyramid. And the Great Pyramid is pretty much on the 31 degrees east longitudinal line. And we find that Adam's calendar, Adam's pyramids, Great Zimbabwe, and the Great Pyramid of Giza are perfectly aligned along the 31 degrees longitudinal east. 31 is also the numeric value for the word Elohim in the Bible. Remember, all ancient Greek and Hebrew words have numeric values, and that value is 31. Important thing. So... In conclusion, what were all these stone circles for? I've got five minutes left, so I'm going to go through this quickly. When you start looking at them quickly, no entrances, no doors, all linked by these channels. Look at these beautiful archaeological drawings from 1939. They show us they have no entrances, no doors, all connected like grapes with these roads or channels. Our historians tell us, tell us that these roads were built to drive the people's cattle on. And you can see some of them are concentric circles not just normal circles. And if you know anything about sound or the generation or the amplification of sound, this is what comes to mind. Nikola Tesla told us, just like John Keeley, the earth rings like a bell. And you can tap into that sound frequency as a source of energy wherever you are on the surface of planet earth and use it. And that's what he did so successfully. And then you realize, and we're starting to deal with cymatic shapes and the cymatic phenomenon and what these stone circles are, are actually just the representation of the cymatic energy sound frequencies that lie below the soil. That is why each and every one of those 10 million or more stone circles is completely unique because it represents the cymatic shape of the energy, sound energy that lies below the ground where it is, all surrounded, all connected by those roads. You have it, all of them at one stage. They seem to all be connected by those roads. And then you've got that spider's web effect going out of it. There's a circle in the middle. There's a spider's web effect going out of that. It's a, fo a photograph of a cymatic shape effect. There you've got some more interesting cymatic shapes from Hans Jenny. Um, and just to remind you, the Hindus knew about this. This is a cymatic shape of the Hindu word Om, Aum, the primordial creative source, which was a sound once again. And not only did these guys do this, uh, build these structures, these stone circles, they carved them into rock before they built them. Or, you know, and once again, look at this crack that goes through this carving. The, the patina growth and the, uh, the erosion on that crack would suggest that we're dealing with something extremely old. And uh, so, very quickly, um, this is, the, for example, the cymatic shape of sand when you put it, the, the word ah. Uh, through the metal plate, that's what you find. And look at this, it's not a regular beautiful round circle. That's why many of the stone, well, all the stone walls are not perfectly round. They follow the frequencies, the sound frequencies of these cymatic shapes. To understand how much power these structures generated and energy, we gotta to go to Japan just before the end of the war. The Japanese were gonna smite the Allied army with what they call the death ray. Unfortunately, they got nuked before they could do that. What did they use to generate all this energy in the death ray? It's called a magnetron, a high-frequency, high-energy generating device. Huge amounts of energy. Every, every uh, microwave has got a tiny little magnetron this size in it that generates all the energy in a microwave. Now imagine if a microwave magnetron can generate so much energy and a magnetron about six inches diameter could smite the Allied army, Imagine how much energy a magnetron built out of stone, connective, conductive, alive, 
stone that is 30 meters in diameter. You can clearly see that the shape of these stones, structures, are not just accidental, but very distinctly resemble the shapes of magnetrons, all connected. Look, at there's a channel coming out the magnetron at the top. There's a channel coming out of our giant magnetron tapping in to this entire network and grid of the very densely populated Southern African, I don't know if you can see it, if it's bright enough, but it's an absolute mishmash of stone circles connected by these channels that were generating energy, that were using the energy for all kinds of things. How do we know that they generated energy? Because we measured it. 14 and a half gigahertz at 72 decibels in this particular circle, and I've now really run out of time, so I'm gonna just finish very quickly. Um, incredibly high frequencies, off the charts. I'll be publishing this information. 33 and a half gigahertz, 103 decibels, 58 degrees heat signature. Adam's calendar, the, the maximum heat signature you can measure is 80 degrees, which would suggest that there's a volcano right below your feet. At Adam's calendar, we measure more than 380 gigahertz frequencies, 1,800 megavolts between the two calendar stones in the middle, and more than 80 degrees centigrade heat signature. It maxes out. The machine cannot measure the energies and the frequencies at Adam's calendar. It is by far the highest mind-boggling measurement that we can make. We do not have the technology to measure those frequencies. They all max out. This is what freaked out the technician that came out with me. So what were these ancient stones all about? Well, now we know we got these energy devices. These were just, oops. Um, Basically, you're, doing, you're looking at, reminding you that we're looking at the ice cream cone phenomenon, sound frequencies. Sasers are the latest thing, not lasers, focusing sound to generate energy. And that's a, the latest thing in black ops project and secret military operations. What we're dealing with, with is ancient frequency and laser beam technology that could generate this out of using the laws of nature, getting it out of the ground, through tapping into the cymatic shapes and the energy forms and magnifying it many, many millions of times through building the structures of the magnetron devices. And with that, I'm gonna to have to stop because I've none run well over. So what does this tell us? It tells us that these ancient civilizations understood frequency and the generation of energy. They understood how to use it. They use it for their gold mining operations to do everything they possibly needed to do, probably to help grow. Remember, they channeled their energy into the the hundreds of thousands of square kilometers of the agricultural terraces that helped to grow the crops that they were growing using these energy fields as well. And uh, as above, so below, from the earliest civilization on Earth, probably close to 300,000 years ago, using this advanced technology, we are now starting to rediscover the amazing importance of frequency as a source of energy and sound as a source of energy. All we have to do is go to the stone circles and learn how to use them. They are still alive. They're all giving us frequency and energy every millisecond of every day, all the way to the first civilization right here in South Africa. So take it home. Think about it. If you know someone that can take this to a further level, tell them about it. Thanks for listening. Hope to see you soon. <laughs>